a very warm and good evening to one and all from New Delhi. I am Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director of Impact and Policy Research Institute, also known as IMPRI. Um, one of the greatest human tragedies of the contemporary era unleashed by the coronavirus has become a wake up call and has provided several lessons in the conduct of all aspects of human lives, personal, professional, societal, and even institutional in India and in every country of the world. One of the institutions that have been deeply impacted by COVID-19 has been the Panchayati Raj in India. Panchayats have, have been at the core of functioning of India's rural governance even before they received a constitutional mandate through the 73rd uh, Constitutional Amendment in 1992. Forming the basis of spirit of decentralization in the country, Panchayats have been at the forefront of village level governance and polity. It is important to understand how the Panchayati Raj institutions have been empowered during this time of crisis so that the citizens in the villages can be assured of continuity and smooth functioning of their activities. With these few words, I welcome you all to the distinguished lecture on lessons from COVID-19 empowering Panchayati Raj institutions to be delivered by Mr. Mani Shankar Ayer. It is my absolute delight and privilege to inform you that this session will be chaired by the expert himself, Professor James Mayner, who is joining us from Brighton, United Kingdom. I take this opportunity to introduce to you the very renowned political scientist, Professor Mayner, whose work has mostly focused on politics and state society relations in less developed countries. Much of, the, much of his work has been on South Asia, mainly India. He specializes in the study of democratic decentralization, politics, development, and state society relations, elections, politicians, political institutions, and poverty. He has authored several books, some of which include the classic writings like The Political Economy of Democratic Decentralization, published by the World Bank in 1999, Power, Poverty, and Poison, Disaster and Response in an Indian City, published by Sage in 1990, Rethinking Third World Politics, published by Longmans in 1991, and numerous research articles, mono monographs, opinion pieces in the media, etc. Professor Maynard holds a bachelor degree from Yale University and a DPhil from the University of Sussex. He has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, Washington, DC. He has been a professional fellow and head of research, Institute of Development Studies, University of Sussex, director of Commonwealth Studies and professor of Commonwealth Politics, University of London, visiting professor of government at Harvard University, research fellow at Center for International Study, Studies at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, senior research fellow at US National Endowment for Humanities, lecturer in politics at University of Leicester, assistant professor of history at Yale University, senior research fellow at Australian National University, tutor in South Asian studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Professor Maynard has held numerous consultancies for institutions like the Ford Foundation, the World Bank, the Swedish International Development Agencies, the United Nations Development Program, GTZ, the Norwegian Aid Agency, British Department for International Development, the World Economic Forum, OECD, and several others. He has been an advisor on democratic decentralization to the governments of Bangladesh, Colombia, and Zambia, and to the Prime Minister's office in India, the Commonwealth Secretary, the British Council, and the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and several others. I welcome you, sir, and extend my gratitude to you for accepting our invitation to chair this session. I now request you to make your opening remarks, after which I will request your permission to formally introduce Mr. Mani Shankar Ayer. Over to you, Professor Mena. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I'm grateful to, uh, <clears throat> in these difficult times, to have a close encounter with, uh, with India, uh, my main interest in life in some ways. <clears throat> we all uh, want to hear Mani Shankar Iyer speak, so I will only say a few brief things. <clears throat> but the topic he's, ta he's talking about is very important. Uh, India has demonstrated 
that uh, Panchayati Raj, democratic decentralization, can have a strong positive impact in all kinds of areas. We've long known, uh, really since the 90s, that uh, Panchayati Raj and decentralization strengthens uh, transparency and accountability, uh, that it um, deepens democracy by drawing ordinary people in villages into uh, the democratic process, uh, and lots of other uh, things which we can talk about perhaps a little later. <clears throat> but I, I should just stress one really very important new discovery that we have, not, not I, but uh, my colleagues have made uh, uh, concerning Panchayati Raj. Recently, uh, two Indians and a Swiss scholar published a book uh, on, called Decentralization and Empowerment for Rural Development, published in, uh, by the Cambridge University Press in India and in the West. The authors are S. S. Meenakshi Sundaram in Bangalore, uh, Hari Nagarajan, uh, a distinguished uh, econometrician, and Hans Binswanger, who is a Swiss uh, veteran of the World Bank, now living in South Africa. Uh, and uh, Hans Binswanger is a major authority on decentralization. They looked very carefully at uh, very strong and very extensive data um, on India's experiment with decentralization, with panchayats. And this is, a, they wrote a book which is a, what, what I would call a warts and all study. It, it doesn't shrink from saying that there are some problems uh, in panchayats uh, and it goes into detail on it. But the, the most important finding in this book uh, is, um, uh, I think a, a, an authoritative proof that Panchayati Raj can assist with poverty alleviation. It can help poor people. Now, until about 10 years ago, uh, most of us thought that Panchayati Raj and decentralization would not have much positive impact on poverty. We had no evidence to show that that was the case. And I, I myself argued that uh, it probably did not help reduce poverty. But the three authors of this book have demonstrated that I was wrong. And I'm very glad to know that I was wrong. They have shown that when you have, a, when elected local councils are allowed to exist in villages for many years, as they have been in India since the 90s, uh, poorer people uh, learn how the democratic process works at the local level. They become involved in the democratic process, they participate more, and they pursue their interests. They defend their rights. And in the process, elected councils have to, be, have to respond with something, something of substance for poor people, not just promises, but real benefits. This has happened in India, they demonstrate. And that discovery makes this book, the most important book on decentralization to appear anywhere in the world in the last 15 years. It's decentralization and empowerment for rural development. And now this, uh, it adds one extremely important reason for us to be enthusiastic about Panchayati Raj and democratic decentralization. And I look forward very keenly to hearing what Mani Shankar Iyer has to say about this because he knows this subject inside out. So please introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Professor Mena, for your clear and uh, lucid insights right at the outset. Uh, and, um, of course, listening to you is a treat to anyone who is interested in the development processes. May I, um, so, um, I am now delighted to introduce to you Mr. Mani Shankar Ayer, a former career diplomat, politician, and government official, who, after a, career, after a long distinguished foreign service career, became a senior leader in the Indian National Congress. Mr. Ayer has attended the prestigious Thun School in Dehradun, 
He went on to earn two degrees in economics, one at the St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, and second at the University of Cambridge. In 1963, Mr. Iyer entered the Indian Foreign Service, and over the next 15 years, he served at various overseas diplomatic postings, including Belgium and Iraq. In 1978, when there was a slight warm up in the relations between India and Pakistan, he was named as India's first consul general to that country, occupying the long unused office of the Deputy High Commission in Karachi. He remained there until 1982, after which he returned to New Delhi to serve for the next year as the Joint Secretary in the National Government's Ministry of External Affairs. The final portion of his foreign service career from 1985 to 89 was also spent in New Delhi, where he was assigned to the office of his school friend, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. Mr. Iyer decided to retire from the foreign service in 1989 to pursue a career in politics and became a member of the Congress party. He first ran for elected office in 1991 when he won a seat from Tamil Nadu to the Lok Sabha. He was re-elected to it in 1999 and in 2004. In 2004, he joined the cabinet of the newly formed Congress-led United Progressive Alliance or the UPA coalition, where until 2009, he was the head of the Panchayati Raj, the, the ministry overseeing India's system of panchayats or the self-governing village councils. During his tenure in the UPA government, Mr. Iyer also held the portfolios of the ministries of petroleum and natural gas, youth affairs and sports, and development of Northeastern region. In 2006, he was honored as the year's outstanding parliamentarian by the president of India. In 2010, he was nominated to the Rajya Sabha, the upper house of the parliament, by the president on the strength of his expertise in the field of social services and his literary accomplishments. There, he served on the Standing Committee on Rural Development and on the Consultative Committee on External Affairs. He has been, to, he has been known as the fierce protagonist for peace between India and Pakistan through, uh, diplomat, uh, through diplomacy and dialogue. He is a prolific writer, newspaper and journal columnist, and an authority on South Asian politics. Some of his books include Remembering Rajiv in 1992, Nikarwala's Silly Billies and Other Curious Creatures in 1995, Confessions of a Secular Fundamentalist, 2004, and A Time of Transition, Rajiv Gandhi to the, to the 21st Century, published in 2009. A candid and eloquent speaker, a practitioner, and a strong advocate of strengthening of Panchayati Raj institutions in India, Mr. Mani Shankar Ayer. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and joining us today to deliver this special and distinguished lecture. Before I invite you, Mr. Ayer, to deliver your lecture, I request the audience to pose their questions to for either Professor Maynard or Mr. Ayer, or both, on the chat box, which will be taken up subsequently. Um, Mr. Ayer, the floor is yours now. So uh, before before I, if you, if Ritika you could just put on the picture, I would love to share a um, story behind it. This is actually um, a real photograph which has been taken by me. It is my grandparents' uh, place. So the pink building is where, it is a makeshift arrangement between Panchayat and the government school. And the banyan tree which you see in the right is where the Panchayat actually sits. And when it rains, they move on, move to the building inside. Yeah, so thank you very much. And over to you, Prof. Uh, Mr. Mani Shankar Ayer. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to have been invited by Dr. Simi Mehta and Impri to speak to you on a subject that is so topical that I cannot think of anything that is more relevant to uh, India on the 17th of August, 19, uh, 2020, than the one that Simi has chosen for me to speak about. And I would need to go back to the constitution to begin explaining the connection between dealing with COVID-19 or indeed any other problem of health and what we have in the panchayats or what the panchayats are supposed to do 
in terms of their constitutional duty, provided, of course, the state legislature and the state governments empower them to fulfill those functions. So first and foremost, let me go back to basics in terms of going back to part nine of the constitution, as well as I'll be invoking part 9A that deal respectively with the panchayats and the municipalities and link the two of them together through the district planning committee, which is provided for in the in schedule 9A, uh, not in schedule nine. Now, what it says in schedule nine with respect to the panchayat and much the same is repeated with respect to the constitutional duties set out illustratively in the 12th schedule that applies to the municipalities. But as that is that entry is exactly the same as in the 11th schedule, basically the constitution amenders had in a sense foreseen that there could be a major health problem in India that would require to be resolved at both the rural and the urban level through a mechanism called the district planning committee on which members elected to the rural panchayats were to be represented uh, to a larger extent than those elected to all municipal bodies in the urban areas, excluding the metropolitan areas. But added to that clause, there was a provision for a committee on metropolitan planning that was supposed to do uh, all the tasks mentioned in the, the schedules to the uh, 9th and part 9A of the constitution, but in the metropolitan areas and not in the district areas. Now, what does it say? It says in Article 243G that the legislature of a state may by law endow the panchayats with such powers and authority as may be necessary to enable them to function as institutions of self-government. Please note that. That they are supposed to be endowed with such powers and authority as may be, as will enable them to function as institutes of self-government. For what? In respect of A, the preparation of plans for economic development and social justice, and B, the implementation of schemes for economic development and social justice, and this is a crucial clause, as may be entrusted to them, including the matters listed in the 11th schedule. So this implementation of schemes is dependent upon two factors. One, they have to be entrusted with this responsibility by the state legislature and through the state legislature, the state government, and also should refer to what is mentioned in the 11th schedule. Now I'll read out entries relating to COVID protection <coughs> implicitly in the 11th schedule. There is item 23, which is the one that relates most directly to COVID-19 issues. 23 says that this empowerment that I talked to you about relates to or should relate to health and sanitation, including hospitals, primary health centers, and dispensaries. So where states have actually fulfilled their constitutional obligation to empower the panchayats to look after questions of health and sanitation, both of which are intimately connected with this problem of COVID-19 
and where such responsibilities are institutionally exercised through hospitals, primary health centers, and dispensaries under the overall supervision of the PRIs, that is the Panchayat uh, Raj institutions, there I think we can expect to see far greater success in attending to problems of COVID-19 in rural India and what I may call municipal India than where this attention is not being given to the PRIs. There are at least three other subjects which are relevant to this uh, pandemic. One is women and child development, because that is where you get the Anganwadi workers. And these Anganwadi workers, while their responsibility is confined to children and extend to some extent to women, particularly pregnant and lactating women, um, it is clear that this is a category that is affected by COVID-19 and the Anganwadi workers along with the auxiliary nurses and midwives can play a very, very important role in tackling problems arising out of uh, COVID-19. Then we have in, uh, in entry 26, social welfare including the welfare of the handicapped and mentally retarded. Now, these are two categories which are not immune from COVID-19, but you can imagine what problems would arise for a mentally retarded or a physically handicapped person, with the correct word now is physically challenged person or a mentally challenged person in such a crisis when it's such a major issue for people who are not physically or mentally challenged. And then there is a reference to the welfare of the weaker sections in entry 27. Now these, this is a category which requires perhaps the biggest attention because well-off people or people higher in the caste categorization of rural society can through their other influence through the other empowerment that they have, more easily access medical care than people who belong to the weaker sections. And finally, the public distribution system that has been entrusted <clears throat> through the 11th schedule and all its conditions to the local bodies. This has acquired huge salience today because all these migrant workers who have returned to their homes, to homes from where they left because there was inadequate income for the family and no job opportunities, they have all come back. And it is only through the public distribution system that they can have access to the most basic requirement of life which in addition to drinking water, which is also in the 11th schedule, is food, particularly food grades that are distributed through the public distribution system and others, other goods that are also available through the PDS. So you can see that a pandemic situation was implicitly built in to the kind of responsibilities which it was hoped would be, these panchayats would be endowed with long before the pandemic struck. When the pandemic strikes, it's a little difficult to gear up these institutions to fulfill these primary responsibilities. While this can be done and is attempting to be done, it is really where this was already done in the normal course of things. In the 25 years that have passed, or really the 26 years that have passed, since the 73rd and 74th amendments were gazetted after receiving the assent of the president, after that, and that also was 
made available only after half the state governments had indicated their acceptance of these constitutional amendments. We now find in this pandemic that it is the states that have endowed these powers on health and sanitation, women and child development, social welfare, welfare of the weaker sections and the public distribution system to the panchayats who have been most effective in combating the disease. But before I name them, I want to also take into account the metropolitan areas where separate from the district planning committees, there was an arrangement made for a committee on metropolitan development planning, which was supposed to undertake similar tasks in the metropolitan areas. And why am I invoking those clauses in this context when in fact, Simi has only referred to Panchayati Raj is because the term Panchayati Raj, although used specifically for rural India in the constitution applies across the board to municipalities and metropolitan areas as well. And it is because it's in the metropolitan areas of India and the larger municipal areas that this disease has taken root, if you like, has been most widespread. It is important to note that one also sees a certain connection between effective metropolitan administration as an institution of local self-government and the response to the pandemic. So I'm going to take both categories into consideration before I start awarding brownie points to the better panchayats and the worst panchayats. And by panchayats, I also include the municipalities and the metropolitan areas. I'm taking a broad view of what the panchayats mean. And this is necessary, necessary in this context because the COVID disease has struck first and struck most deeply in metropolitan areas and only gradually spread into the municipalities first and foremost, and then into rural India. So I think now I should be able to start awarding my brownie points. The most vulnerable state in India to COVID-19 was always Kerala for the very good reason that a substantial proportion of the working population of Kerala are, constitute the Kerala diaspora. They have not got equivalent employment opportunities within the state and therefore, they are to be seen in very large numbers, not only in the rest of India, but more significantly still in the Gulf area, as well as in Britain, around Birmingham. And a lot of them are there in America as well. Indeed, when I was in Chongqing, in China, a little before the epidemic broke, I was amazed to find in a Chongqing mall, a young man from Tamil Nadu who was making and selling idlis and dosas. And then obviously his, uh, his junior cooks were all from Kerala. So here is a state that was more vulnerable than any other state of India to this imported disease called COVID-19. For there is no doubt at all that COVID-19 was not indigenous to our country. It was imported from other parts of the world 
certainly from China, which produced the first case in India, but also from other parts of the world, including Europe, America, and significantly the Gulf countries. And because so many of these people were from Kerala and were returning to Kerala after the COVID disease had affected these countries, the normal expectation would have been that Kerala would find it next to impossible to cope with the onset and spread of this disease. Yet I think it would have need to be universally accepted that no state has handled the crisis as effectively as, as Kerala has. And there is a direct connection between Kerala, Kerala's demonstrated capacity to handle the COVID pandemic and the fact that for the last 20 years at least, starting with Thomas Isaac's famous people's planning movement, we've had a very deep involvement of the panchayats and other local bodies in matters of health, sanitation, women and child development, welfare of the weaker sections, welfare of and the public distribution system. Especially as these have been strengthened in rural Kerala by a connection made uniquely in Kerala through the Kudum Shri movement, which has linked women's self-help groups to the panchayat system. Also, perhaps it needs mentioning in this connection that Kerala more than any other state has included education, including primary and secondary schools in the Panchayat Raj system. And in fact, gone further than is recommended in the 11th schedule by putting district colleges under the overall supervision of the district panchayats. So you have a well-educated uh, system which, which does not deprive women of their rights, but leverages these women's rights and their organizations into the Panchayati Raj system as also the municipalities and metropolitan systems in anticipation of such a major crisis. Of course, no one knew about COVID-19 till about January, March this year. And I therefore cannot claim that Thomas Isaac or his health minister at the moment, Ms. Shelja, who's also acquired a worldwide reputation, would have put this system into operation in order to tackle a pandemic. They did it to deal with the everyday problems of education, health, sanitation, social welfare, the welfare of the weaker sections, and the public distribution system. But because it was all in place, we have what I would regard as the remarkable achievement in Kerala, which, which is that despite being the most vulnerable state in the country, it has been among the least affected. And to the extent that it has been affected, the recovery rates are remarkable. And it is astonishing that they have been able to do so with considerable loss of economic activity, but very little loss of human life. So it shows that if you have effective self local self-government in the areas that actually matter most to people, including poverty alleviation that Professor Mena was talking about in his introductory remarks. And don't forget that Kerala has higher levels of individual 
and family income than most of the other states of India. The only thing they lack is domestic business or jo job opportunities. But they've more than made up for this by getting these opportunities elsewhere in India. There used to be a joke when I was a young man that the Malayalis are invading Delhi at the rate of 130 words a minute because they were undoubtedly the best stenographers we had in the government of India at that stage in life, that primitive stage in life, when stenographers were still available and in the rest of the world. So they've done it, they've shown it. Now let me take an opposite example. An opposite example is Gujarat. Gujarat is alleged to be, or was alleged to be, particularly in the 2014 elections, a model of how to run the economy, the state economy. And the Gujarat development model and all the propaganda that went around it was, had a major contribution to make to that revolution in Indian politics, which converted a secular country into a Hindu nation. <clears throat> the one fault line in that Gujarat model, which is relevant to us today, is that Mr. Modi as chief minister ran such a centralized state government system that despite the old state of Bombay having been continuously a Panchayati Raj state from 1937 till today, and when that partition between Maharashtra and Gujarat took place, they had a very effective Panchayat Raj system there run by a remarkable man called Hitendra Desai, whom I had the privilege to meet when I was sent to Gujarat for my district training as a probationary officer in the Indian Foreign Service. And I was struck by the manner in which he thought that local self-government is the basis of all effective government and therefore encouraged it. But when Mr. Modi came in, he so centralized the administration that all these local powers got diminished. And especially the administration of the Ahmedabad municipality was left completely powerless because almost every important decision had to be referred to the state government. And it was administrators like commissioners who were loyal to the state government and accepted their subordinate position to the state government who succeeded in remaining in the job. Others were very quickly thrown out. And so we had the extraordinary phenomenon for a number of months from March through to May where Gujarat was the third worst affected state after Maharashtra and, and uh, for a while it even was ahead of Tamil Nadu. And that was the state where after the world had recognized that we were on the edge of a pandemic that Mr. Trump arrived in Gujarat, in Ahmedabad and Mr. Modi arranged for about 100,000 people to stand shoulder to shoulder, coughing into each other's faces for the welcome accorded to Mr. Trump. The stadium in which the meeting was held could hold about one and a quarter lakh, that is 125,000 uh, members of the audience. And it was said that there was about 70,000 more who were milling around outside with no masks, no social distancing. And inevitably, this led to Ahmedabad becoming the only city in India of its size to become a major hotspot 
before any other city of India reached, arrived at that distinction. In the meanwhile, it was in the metropolitan areas of Bombay or Mumbai and Chennai that we had a huge rise. And in those states, while there has been a huge rise, there has been quite effective containment. There is an example of the Dharavali, Dharavi slum, which was frightening the heebie-jeebies out of everyone in India, because it was felt that if it arrived there, there was simply no controlling this pandemic, because it's the largest slum in the world. And people live not just cheek by jowl, they actually live six to a room, seven to a room, and up to a hundred people share the same toilet. And yet, because the Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation has a very long history of independence and autonomy and experience, we find that they were very effectively able to control the spread of this pandemic in the worst slum in the world, which is Dharavi. Equally, in Chennai, the Metropolitan Council there also has a very long history. Indeed, Lord Ripon started local self-government in municipal areas in Madras, as it was then called, and Chennai, as it is now called. And drawing on that, although the case, the number of cases is extremely high in Tamil Nadu, it's largely confined to the metropolitan area of Tamil Nadu, that is in Chennai, and to some lesser extent in urban agglomerations like Shengalpet recently, Madurai for some time, and Trichy to some small extent. Calcutta, interestingly enough, Kolkata as it is known now, is not a major hotspot for COVID. And West Bengal, which has a long history of Panchayat Raj, which long antedates the constitutional amendment. There it's been there effectively since the communists came into power in 1977. So they have a four of, they have a two decade uh, advantage over the rest of India. They've done well. And then the hill states of India, which have also been fairly advanced in effective Panchayati Raj in the rural areas, and they're mostly rural areas, Himachal Pradesh, Sikkim, which still very recently didn't have a single state, a distinct case, but have had for a long time, when there was 33% reservation, they went, they leapt up to 40% for women. And they don't have a very strong caste system there. And that too helped. So there is a kind of equivalence between effective Panchayati Raj and handling this epidemic pandemic. You can't spread, you can't stop the infections, but you can, where there are large conglomerations of people, but you can effectively control it. At the end of the day, the key figure to look the key figure to look at is not the number of infections but the number of recoveries and even more important the number of fatalities and the fatalities have to also be looked at in the context of comorbidities being a key cause of death when pandemic when this covid-19 strikes any individual's body. If you're otherwise healthy, the chances of recovery are really pretty good. They're over 90%. They are in many cases nearer 98% because the, the death fatality rate in much of India is under 2%. So therefore, one sees that effective Panchayati Raj 
has a correlation with effectively handling the pandemic that has overtaken us. And this, I think, is an important lesson to learn for the future. I'm absolutely delighted that James Maynard has, uh, has stated, has informed us of a book published by a Swiss author with Indian collaborators that I had not heard of before and which I'm going to make my first post-COVID purchase because I must get to it. It uh, seems to bear out several of the hypotheses that I have been holding for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, Simi had mentioned my having had several years in Belgium. It was my first posting for four years in the period 1963-67. And then I went back in our mission to the European Economic Community, as it was then called, and is now the European Union, and spent another three years there. So in many ways, I had a major learning experience in Belgium, which is a very small country. There are only 10 million people there. And the city of Brussels contains one-tenth of that, a million people. And to run the city of Brussels, they have no less than 19 municipalities. 19 municipalities for a city of a million people. And they're so keen on promoting pride in the locality that when I was once returning from Dover to Ostend, a cheeky little Belgian boy in front of me was asked by the immigration officer what his nationality was. And he answered, Anderlecht which is a commune in Brussels, famed for its football team. And because the football is what gave him his identity, he actually claimed that his nationality was not Belgian, but from Anderlecht. And it is in a similar way that in the commune of Wafor, where I lived in my second posting in Brussels, I found that they were bringing out pamphlets that told the history of Boisfort from the middle of the 11th century to the present. And everything about what could be called sightseeing in this tiny little commune, uh, which was noted primarily for its cherry trees, which blossomed in the spring, was listed there. And then I was, as a foreign service officer, absolutely delighted to find that passports in Belgium are issued by the local authority, not by the foreign office and not by the home ministry. So I was so taken with this form of responsive administration that when Rajiv Gandhi started talking about responsive administration and from that arrived at his concept of constitutional panchayati raj, I was so taken with this idea because it had been in me for many decades before I joined him that I was drafted for my enthusiasm more than for any local government experience as his right hand in uh, evolving and implementing these ideas. Back in about a decade ago, I was asked to head a committee which looked into the leveraging of Panchayati Raj institutions for the more effective delivery of, law, of uh, public goods and services. Professor Mena was one of those who I interviewed or my committee interviewed on that occasion. The report that came out was dumped by my own government and has of course been completely forgotten by the successor governments. But I think uh, it would be useful to dust off the covers and look through those five volumes because we made a number of recommendations 
I think they amounted altogether to about 60 or 70 recommendations, which in the light of the experience of, of implementing the provisions of part nine and part nine A of the constitution had emerged and on which we recommended that action be taken. And there was a great deal of emphasis on how we could effectively involve by devolution the local governments or the local self-governments in the implementation of centrally sponsored schemes, which provide a huge amount of money, which really ought to be in the hands of the local authorities for expenditure on issues such as those listed in the 11th and 12th schedules as added to or subtracted from by state legislation. But uh, neither the Planning Commission, nor the Finance Ministry, nor the Government of India took any interest in these recommendations when our party, my party, the Congress party was in power. And unsurprisingly, the Chief Minister who had the distinction of being the only Chief Minister to not allow me to visit the Panchayati Raj institutions in his state. Every other state gave me that permission. And I ultimately visited over 150 village panchayats around the country. And along with these village panchayats, I would go to the intermediate panchayat, as well as the district panchayat, and in many cases, the municipal authorities. That one state was Gujarat. And so I'm not surprised that the chief minister of Gujarat at that time is now as prime minister responsible for the worst performance of any state of its kind in India in this COVID crisis. I relate Narendra Modi's refusal to understand what devolution means even to his home minister leave alone the panchayats and the municipalities for being personally responsible for a state which should in the normal course have returned an excellent performance on COVID-19, but which because the same man from the same state has been chief minister for, I'd forgotten, 15 years and prime minister of India for six years has now returned the worst comparable result of any state of its kind. So I end with the plea that we must empower the local self-government institutions with all that is required to effectively implement the 11th and 12th schedules, except to the extent to which the 11th or 12th schedules have been modified by state legislation. To the best of my knowledge, every state has accepted every entry in the 11th and 12th schedule in its state legislation, and in some cases added several items to the original illustrative list. So it's not a constitutional failure. It's not even a failure of municipal law. The failure is in political will and maybe COVID-19 was sent to our country to remind us that if we do not have effective Panchayati Raj, which I have defined as inclusive governance for inclusive growth, we are not going to see the India of Mahatma Gandhi's dreams. And allow me to remind you of what Mahatma Gandhi said in 1931 when he was asked, what is your dream for India? This was 16 years before we became independent and long before there was any realistic possibility of our securing our independence. Gandhiji did not reply as to what his dreams were. He said, I shall work for an India. He wasn't going to dream for an India. I shall work for an India in which the poorest shall feel that this is his country, in the making of which 
he has an effective voice. And that is why he wanted Indian democracy to not be based on the Westminster model, but on a uniquely Indian model of being built up from below. The only direct elections he wanted were to the village panchayats, which he conceived as having an electorate like a college in our universities of two or 300 persons. And that thereafter it would be an indirect process so that money power and muscle power, which he foresaw were integral to the democratic process, the corruption of the democratic process would be evident. It wouldn't happen. But unfortunately his wisdom was contested by Dr. Ambedkar, whose experience of the Indian village was completely different owing to his caste. And he described these uh, villages of India as cesspools and regarded Gandhi's idea as romantic. So when Nathuram Godse fired those three bullets into Mahatma Gandhi's chest on the 30th of January, 1948, he not only killed the greatest saint that India has ever produced, he also killed Panchayati Raj. And it was with great difficulty that a Gandhian called K. Santanam, who was destined to lose from the same constituency from which I lost in 2009, exactly the same constituency, he was the one responsible for bringing in a reference to Panchayati Raj <coughs> on the state list and in the <clears throat> directive principles of state policy. Rajiv Gandhi saw that that is not the correct place for Panchayati Raj and therefore eventually, although not in his lifetime, was able to give us constitutional local self-government and it is now for us, the inheritors of that legacy, to bring that about. I just want to add with one important point. Every other democracy, including the democracy to which Professor Mena belongs, built up their democracies from below. There was the parish and there was the county, which mattered for democracy much more. And many centuries before, you got effective parliamentary democracy in the United Kingdom. And let's not forget that women did not get the vote until 1928 in Britain, not until 1947 in France. And in the United States, a huge proportion of its population, the Native Americans as they're now called, and Red Indians as they were called when I was a red-blooded youth, and the African slaves, they were disenfranchised. And even in Britain, the Catholics were not allowed to vote till 1832, and people without property were not enfranchised till 1867. So if there was democracy in those places, it was in the parishes and the county councils that you had this democracy for years, decades, centuries, before you got democracy in parliament. And in America, because it was a country that through the 18th and 19th centuries was expanding westwards and southwards from the New England states, they needed to have self-government to maintain some kind of law and order with the result that every post on the frontier was elected, starting particularly with the sheriff who was in effect the sarpanch of his village and extending today to the dog catcher who is elected in California. And Kamala Harris, who is now very much on Indian minds, let's not forget that she was the attorney general, which is not an appointed post in America. It's an elective post. She was elected as the attorney for South Africa, for South San Francisco, and then attorney general for California before she became a senator and now is the vice president. So the number of elected officers at the local government level in the developed democracies 
has been much, much greater than today. It is in India, well, until Rajiv Gandhi came, because in those countries, democracy at the higher levels was built upon the foundation of democracy at the bottom. When Rajiv became prime minister, he saw that this was, it was the opposite that was true of India. We had built democracy in parliament and the state legislatures, but without a democratic base. So we were literally a castle in the air. And that was why democracy or democratic values were not taking root in our country. Now, the most, the biggest achievement of India, the biggest social uh, revolution in India is almost unknown to our people. It is the empowerment of women through the local government institutions. We have in India today, just under 15 lakh, 15 lakh elected women officials of whom one lakh actually hold office as chairperson in these local bodies. It was the crown princess of Norway <coughs> who informed me that she has been as minister that she had calculated that there are more elected women in India alone than in the rest of the world put together. And yet this amazing revolution is virtually unknown among particularly the chattering classes and the chattering women of India. Because the chattering women of India want to be in parliament in the state legislatures and have very little concern with their more humble sisters. And this has resulted in virtually no knowledge and no celebration of what Panchayati Raj has done for the women of India. And because it's done that for the women of India, to the extent that panchayats and municipalities have been used to tackle or combat this pandemic, they have fulfilled their roles. I don't think in such a backward reactionary society as ours, women would have been given 50% reservation in 15 states of India, but for the fact that they have performed extremely well. And uh, if there is, I, I, I believe very strongly that the presence of women in our state legislatures and in parliament must be raised immediately to 50%. And for that, I would suggest that every parliamentary constituency be divided into two, so that one half of it is represented by a woman of whatever party, and the other half is represented by a man of whatever party. And if that is not acceptable, then let's have double member parliamentary constituencies, which will elect both a man and a woman, possibly from different parties. But at least it will bring, raise the voice of women from its current level of about, I think, 12% to their proportion of the population, which is half. If this could be done, then maybe these armchair women will start celebrating what has happened to their humbler sisters. But until then, I'm afraid we remain such an elitist society that we do not think the empowerment of poor women is the route to the empowerment of all women including those who have the good fortune of having several saris and many, many shoes in their cupboards. This is a very unequal society and only Panchayati Raj can promote that social justice, which is essential to realize the dreams of Ambedkar, who whatever his views on Panchayati Raj may have been, was a stern and strong advocate of making us a more equal society. That is why he introduced the word fraternity taken from the French Revolution into the preamble of our constitution. We cannot be a fraternity until we become a sorority and treat all the men and women of the weaker sections particularly 
equally with the rest of us privileged people. Thank you very much for this golden opportunity. And I look forward to answering such questions as might be directed to me. But I would recommend to many of the questioners that they also take advantage of the presence of Professor Mena, who academically is far more distinguished than I could ever hope to be. Thank you. Jay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. It is actually and absolutely amazing to the ears of anybody who would love to, you know, listen to your views. Thank you very much for so lucidly walking us through the constitutional provisions of Panchayati Raj and then comparing and contrasting it with how what lessons we have learned. And of course, you have rightly pointed out that for if effective control or treatment or uh, yes, effective control of the pandemic is directly proportional to an effective functioning of the Panchayati Raj system or uh, which, which would uh, lead to an inclusive governance for inclusive growth uh, in order to realize the dreams of Gandhiji and Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Thank you for, um, uh, yes, correctly pointing out that, uh, the, that we need to effectively implement the 11th and 12th schedules in the state legislature um, yes, thank you very much. And of course, there are a number of questions that are being uh, posed, and uh, we will come back to you with the questions. Um, with these words, um, I now invite Professor Mena to make his remarks on, and um, discuss uh, on uh, what Mr. Manishankar Ayer had to say and uh, your views, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Sir, you are on mute. Could you unmute yourself? How's that? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I will be very brief uh, because I'm sure you have uh, numerous uh, inter interesting questions. I would just make one point uh, in response to what Mani Shankar Iyer said in, in those very useful comments. Um, and, and it has to do with panchayats in villages uh, and their contribution to dealing with COVID-19. Long before we heard of COVID-19, we knew from plenty of evidence that Gram panchayats in Indian villages helped to prevent disease and to save lives because uh, the women who sit on the Gram Panchayats uh, were able to develop a sense of trust between ordinary villagers who are just people just like them and health professionals, doctors and nurses. Uh, before Panchayati Raj took root, uh, poor people in villages, the poor women uh, who are the gatekeepers between the health services and the household, Poor women were often afraid to take their children or to take themselves to uh, doctors and nurses because they could see that doctors and nurses wore strange white coats, they carried needles, they looked intimidating. And because the doctors and nurses uh, were middle class people who could not explain the need for health care to villagers in the way that villagers would understand. The women members of panchayats, who are villagers, were, were quite able to explain to other villagers, other women, why it's a good idea, for example, to take, your, uh, to take yourself, if you are pregnant, to a, an antenatal care treatment. Or when the children are born, to take the children for postnatal care, inoculations, that kind of thing. And a sense of trust was developed mainly by the women members of panchayats uh, in the medical services. As a result of this, the numbers of villagers taking up medical treatment and treating doctors and nurses without fear, the numbers increased a lot in states with strong panchayats. So Panchayati Raj in this way, uh, by creating a sense of trust, Panchayati Raj prevented illnesses and saved lives long before COVID-19. Now with COVID-19, there are three things that are very important. First, uh, testing for the infection. 
Second, tracing contacts of people who test positive to prevent them passing on the disease. And finally, treatment for those who get the disease. Testing, tracing, and treatment. Now the trust which Panchayat women members have created uh, amongst villagers, the trust towards doctors and nurses uh, will help to make a success of these three absolutely crucial things, tech testing, tracing, and treatment. This probably has something to do with the successes we have seen in, for example, Kerala. Uh, so this is just a little background to fill in details behind some of the points that Mani Shankar Iyer was making. But I think now it's best that we hear some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mena, for your comments. So uh, yes, uh, we now come to the question and answers uh, part of the program. Um, what I would do is I would uh, just uh, pose uh, two questions each for Professor Mena and Mr. Ayer and uh, invite uh, both of you to answer um, uh, taking turns. Um, as uh, obvious, uh, there are uh, more questions directed to uh, Mr. Ayer. So yes, uh, the first question is um, uh, to Mr. Ayer, uh, why did the policy makers ignore, the, ignore on the lack of social control over misuse of funds in the Panchayat Raj institutions and sanction money? Uh, why are we not able to bring in radical changes at the villages by empowering the local artisans? Uh, if this is not possible, how are we aiming for a revitalization of uh, the villages. Uh, the second question is, uh, you have uh, direct, you have clearly pointed out that uh, Kerala has, um, because Kerala has had a strong uh, history of local institution, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, that is why they were more able to you know, proactively deal uh, with the crisis. Um, but what about other states? Uh, has there been, um, a, a trust deficit, or uh, what? What do you have to say in that front? Um, the next question is for uh, Professor Mena. Uh, coming to the trust deficit, both uh, top down and bottom up, uh, which ultimately led to the poor tackling of crisis in India. Do you think that uh, the bureaucracy served as a facilitator? or as a detriment to such efforts, because ultimately they are answerable to the uh, state and uh, the union government. And um, as, uh, as an academic expert, Professor Mena, uh, is there a lesson which can be drawn, fr uh, drawn from India's uh, uh, Panchayat Raj institutions uh, and taken it, for the, taken it or extrapolated it for the West uh, in the functioning of the PRIs? So with this uh, first round, uh, over to you, Mr. Ayer. Um, first, I'd like to say that the questions that were put to me were like my favorite ice cream when I didn't have diabetes, which was the three in one. So there are a number of points that were covered and I'll try and answer them as uh, effectively as I can. Uh, the first set of questions inquired why it is that there is a misuse of funds in the panchayats. Well, my short answer to that is that the more effective panchayati raj is, the less is the corruption. And the greater is, uh, the weaker is the panchayati raj system, the more is the corruption. And while it is invidious to draw comparisons, I would suggest that the questioner make his own inquiries about corruption and Panchayati Raj in Uttar Pradesh, which has virtually no effective Panchayat Raj, and corruption and Panchayati Raj in Kerala or Karnataka, which have very effective of Panchayati Raj. And he would find that the first answer lies in whether there is a Panchayati Raj system. In many states of India, particularly in Northern India, it is not Panchayati Raj, it is Sarpanch Raj. The Gram Sabha is either non-existent 
or rarely consulted or their demands are simply brushed aside by the bureaucracy. So you cannot have any democracy at any level unless there is accountability to the representatives of the electorate. And in the case of Panchayati Raj, to the electorate itself. So I think one of the worst things we did in preparing the constitution amendment was that we did not spell out what the Gram Sabha is supposed to do. And to the best of my knowledge, the only legislation in which the frequency of convening the Gram Sabhas, supplementing the Gram Sabha with Ward Sabhas, and ensuring that questions asked by the Gram Sabha are answered by the, those in authority, be they the panchayat itself or the bureaucrats, is in Karnataka, at least in the Karnataka legislation of 2016, which unfortunately, owing to instability in Karnataka, has still not been implemented properly. But at least on paper, it exists as a mechanism to more effectively control uh, financial discipline in these institutions. Second, because almost all the funds available to the Gram Panchayats comes from the grants of the Finance Commission, which are totally untied and on which conditions cannot be imposed by state governments through whom they are directed to the Panchayats, if there is effective Panchayati Raj, in other words, if the pan punch, the punches are empowered to deal with these funds in their respective areas of competence, and if they are held responsible to an effective Gram Sabha or Ward Sabha, then the amount of corruption will come down. But if suddenly a, a Gram Sabha, uh, um, sorry, uh, Sarpanch finds that he has a crore of rupees in his hands to be spent within a, a year and nobody knows uh, what he's going to do with it. Well, the temptation to be corrupt is very high and therefore the temptation to spend astronomical sums of money to get elected to these very humble posts is extremely tempting. So if you cannot have good Panchayati Raj unless you have a well-structured Panchayat system. And much of West, much of Southern, Western, and parts of Eastern India have well-structured Panchayat Raj institutions. Most of North India does not. But every state of India, I'm happy to say, has more effective Panchayati Raj than was true before these constitution amendments. Indeed, all the mandatory provisions of the constitution have been brought into effect. It is the recommendatory uh, articles of the constitution which have been more or less fulfilled more in the better Panchayat Raj states and less in the worse Panchayat Raj states. But in every state, there is some element of progress and very backward states like Rajasthan and Haryana did really come up when uh, I was intimately involved with these matters. And the hill states of India, Himachal and uh, Sikkim on the other side, they've done a good job. And so have some of the smaller states like Tripura, outstanding. Uh, and that perhaps accounts for how the communists have been able to retain Tripura when they've lost West Bengal. Because in West Bengal, it changed from Panchayat Raj to Sarpanch Raj, and then into communist Gunda Raj, and that is why they lost out. In Andhra Pradesh, I'm afraid we've never had effective Panchayati Raj. In Madhya Pradesh, under Digvijay Singh, as chief minister, particularly in his first term, impressive strides were made. 
very impressive. And I think that is why he did so well to win a second term. But in his second term, he made the crucial error of converting the district panchayat into what he called the district government and put the minister in charge at the head of the district planning committee. And therefore, inevitably, his defeat at the end of the second term was foreseen. I'm very glad to say that Chhattisgarh, which was a BJP state, did very well in Panchayati Raj and has done even better in the current dispensation. So it's a, it's a cure its egg. It's good in parts, it's bad in parts. But everywhere, even in UP, and certainly in Bihar, and to a very large extent in, in uh, Maharashtra, there has been substantial movement forward. So it's a matter of political will also. Unfortunately, most politicians recognize that if the panchayats are really empowered, then they are going to be disempowered. So even when they are well disposed towards Panchayati Raj as a concept, when it comes to watching their political juniors wielding more executive power than as legislators they can do, they come in the way and they hold it back. That is why this outstanding uh, legislation of 2016 in Karnataka called the Gram the Karnataka Gram Sabha and Panchayat Raj Act has not effectively been brought into implementation in the last four years. There are too many people even within the Congress, despite the fact that this was Congress legislation, who dragged their feet. And of course, the BJP was in outright opposition. So what we had not factored in was that without political dedication to this cause, we were not going to be able to translate a piece of legislation which had empowerment in the recommendatory part and not in the mandatory part. And that was inevitable because Panchayati Raj was in the state list. It was not on the central list or the concurrent list. And we've wrestled with this problem since then. And the one person who back then in 1989 understood that this was going to be a problem, possibly because he was a politician living in a completely political milieu, Rajiv Gandhi. I asked him, sir, how long do you think it'll take for us to bring this into effect? And he smiled and replied, a generation at least. Now, 25 years is regarded as a generation. And a generation later, I can say that we have made Panchayati Raj irremovable, irreversible, ineluctable. That is a major achievement. But we haven't made it universally empowered. And we won't be able to do that until there is political will at the center operating effectively upon politicians in the provinces, in the states. And uh, now, of course, we have a complete absence of any desire for any kind of devolution or decentralization. So I think the next few years are really a pretty dark hole for Panchayati Raj. But happily, the institutions exist. And when conditions become more conducive, either at the state level or at the central level, I think we might expect to see a further push, particularly if Panchayati Raj is given to the portfolio, is given to someone who's interested in the subject, like I was, and not given to all my successors who regard this as an unnecessary and undesirable burden to whatever else it is that they are dealing with. And I think it is necessary to also de-link the municipal Panchayati Raj from the Ministry of Urban Development and de-link Panchayati Raj from rural development and have a single composite ministry 
for the panchayats in the municipalities, as for example, the state government of Kerala have done. So these are my general answers to the specific questions that were posed to me. If I missed out something, I think the fault is the questioners who are having asked too many questions in the guise of a single question. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We'll come back to you again. Um, so, uh, yes, over to you, Professor Mena. Yes, uh, the, one of the questions was, are bureaucrats facilitators or problems for Panchayati Raj? And the answer is sometimes one and sometimes the other. Um, in some states that I have seen and done, and done research in, I'm speaking of uh, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Rajasthan, uh, civil servants uh, in the state governments <clears throat> understand that Panchayati Raj is at the, at the state level, they understand that Panchayati Raj is quite a good thing because it helps their departments to achieve the tasks that they're supposed to achieve. For example, the, the health bureaucrats will be keen on Panchayati Raj because more people bring their kids and themselves to clinics for treatment um, as a result and the improvements in health are, are clear. Uh, but there are all these uh, uh, bureaucrats in, uh, in all levels and in all states who are not happy about Pontiac Raj. They prefer to dominate things um, and they resent, uh, resent them. So there, there can be problems as well. But the real, uh, <coughs> pardon me, the real opponents of Pontiac Raj in India and in every other country in the world are the legislators, as, as Mani Shankarayar suggested, they don't, they don't want their power taken away and given to elected officials at local level. So that's, but that's not an Indian problem, that's a global problem and it's just there. Uh, now the second question was about uh, lessons from India's panchayats for the West. Uh, and I would just say that um, uh, the West has a lot to learn, the world has a lot to learn from India's panchayat system. There is no uh, system of democratic decentralization with more positive lessons than the Indian case. Uh, and certainly Western countries could learn a lot. Uh, in fact, what we have in England and in Britain now uh, is a, a government that is blindly over-centralizing uh, the treatment of the COVID crisis and everything else. And as a result of this, uh, the, the utility of local councils in England uh, is being ignored. And as a re result of that, more people are getting sick and people are dying because of the lack of decentralization in this system. We could learn a lot here from the Indian exp experience and so could a lot of countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, only in Brazil do you have comparable uh, elected local councils uh, to those that exist in, in India. And uh, we see the, the results of, of that are serious in places like South Africa. South Africa uh, had cr created uh, elected local councils in 2000, but they gave them no significant powers or money. And they were so completely dominated by higher level uh, government that they could achieve nothing. So that, for example, when South Africa tried to introduce a national rural employment guarantee scheme based on the Indian model, they could not make it work well because the, lo the local councils, the panchayats in South Africa are so crippled and weak that they couldn't play the role they play, the crucial constructive role they play in India. And now South Africa cannot get the testing and tracing and treatment processes going with the help of local councils because the councils are too weak. And so they lag behind those states in India with strong panchayats. There are plenty of Indian lessons that the rest of the world could learn. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so yeah, the next question, uh, Next questions again uh, to Mr. Ayer. Um, 
what what do you think what the, what is the motivation that a former chief minister and former prime minister would have to decrease decentralization in the country given the fact that he did not allow you to visit his home state as the chief minister and what are the tools that his government is using to achieve it well, closely related to this is uh, even in the present times uh, there are local power wielders uh, in the villages who impede development for for instance um, there is caste discrimination inequalities of wealth in the villages and at several places uh, the dominant sections of the society do not allow the elected representatives from marginalized sections of the society to visit uh, some areas for instance um, in the in southern tamil nadu konkan region of maharashtra or even parts of rayal seema so your views on this sir uh, the next question is uh, for uh, professor mena uh, in your assessment um have the ministries of um, uh, panchayati raj and rural development done enough uh, in the in tackling the crisis as an uh, as a foreign ob observer but an expert on the theme what are your views and uh, this question uh, is for uh, professor mena uh, and uh, in fact if Prof if mr manish shankar ayer would like to take it up as well subsequently uh, most welcome what do you think uh, do you think that the indian national congress would have responded to the pandemic differently um, if they would have been at the helm of the government during these times so yes uh, with these questions i invite mr manish shankar ayer to respond my <coughs> my response is going to be based on simi's slip of the tongue as she read her question to me she referred to <coughs> a former chief minister and a former prime minister now i'm afraid uh, to the regret of all of us he is not a former prime minister and i think we'll find a good answer only when he does become a former prime minister for the moment uh if the covid problem has been tackled it has been because there is no central response to this matter it has been largely left to state governments to work out their respective responses the center's role has been confined to <coughs> making <coughs> financial disbursements and uh, giving general policy directions but hardly in actually tackling the problem on the ground so the problem on the ground has been tackled to about 90% or more by state governments and because of the legacy on local self government of say kerala in contrast to gujarat the performance in kerala has been so much better there has been an additional problem in amdavad it is that because of the communalization of that polity for the last 20 years or more the slums that have muslim majorities are more neglected than others in maharashtra there is not that problem and therefore in bombay dharavi has been dealt with whether it is a muslim or a hindu area i think this is further complicated matters but overall it is for each state government to respond and i must say most state governments have done a much better job than the central government has in terms of broad policy for the center had no policy beyond number 1 shutting down completely the lockdown at 4 hours notice with no conception of what this will mean for the poor of india because it was the poor of india who suddenly at 4 hours notice found that they didn't have a job that they didn't have a roof above their heads that there was no social security available to them 
there was not even the ration shops available to them because their ration cards were uh, in their homes and there was no transport. So you had this heart-wrenching experience of seeing first hundreds, then thousands, then lakhs, and finally millions on the move, walking to their homes, which were sometimes 100 kilometers away, and sometimes more than a thousand kilometers away. And the most touching stories of what happened to them as they walked home, and walked home to what? To nothing. Because if they had been something at home, they wouldn't have come out in the first place. None of this was properly estimated, nor was it estimated as to how would these migrants, these reverse migrants, be looked after on their way. They walked, they went sometimes by cycle, they were sometimes given lifts on the back of trucks, but there was no public transport available. And often when they reached the borders, there was a border blockade that they couldn't cross the borders. And as for rehabilitation, what uh, Professor Maynard called the TTT, the testing, the tracing, and the treatment, absolutely nothing was available in those villages. And so these people also faced social stigma. Several of them on reaching home found they couldn't go into their villages and were left living on trees and on charity from what, from their home, somebody would come and place a little bit of cooked food at the foot of the tree. And then after the person had left, they would climb down. So all these things which should have been anticipated before putting a lockdown into effect were not because of the central government. And it was only over a period of time that state governments and other authorities, including the media, alerted the central government to what was happening and certain steps of rectification were taken. But otherwise, by and large, it was for the state governments to cope. And some of them had to cope in the middle of a typhoon. We saw that in West Bengal. We're now seeing it in Kerala and in Karnataka and in central India and in the North Indian states where the Ganga flows. UP and Bihar, terrible floods, terrible natural disasters to add to the consequence of this uh, other disaster. There was also the National Disaster Management Authority. It and its branches have done a very good job now, but they were not geared up. And what had to be centrally done, which was to estimate how many personal protection equipment requirements there were? What were the requirements of ventilators? What were the requirements of oxygen? All this was not licked into when the pandemic, which is a health crisis, was translated into a human crisis and an economic crisis of unimagined proportions without precedent. And there does not appear to be a clear roadmap towards dealing with recovery, either in a health sense or in the sense of the economy. But state governments, or many of them anyway, have risen to the occasion. The situation today is much better than was feared at the start. And the kind of, and very fortunately in my opinion, the Tablighi uh, ma uh, Mazars, uh, what is it called? The Tablighi movements. Jamar. Jamar. Yeah, their, their uh, co contribution to COVID, which was being communalized, that has been stopped because now we've discovered that there are any number of non Muslim centers, including the stadium in Ahmedabad, where Mr. Trump was given such a warm welcome have all become centers for the spreading of this disease. So the state which should be ensuring, the center that should be ensuring that there is no atmosphere of communal tension have been persisting with their policies in Kashmir, which affect minorities all over the country and 
liberal opinion all over the country. And then these attacks on uh, Muslims, the lynchings. I think all that is also attributable to the philosophy of the central government. And it's rather insensitive choice of the 5th of August as the date on which to do the inauguration of the Ram Temple. And it was a word of compassion uttered for the Muslim community. Could not the prime minister on that day have said that if I'm invited, I'll also come to the foundation of the mosque. Can you imagine what would have been the impact of that? It would have been the same as Gandhiji in September 1947, insisting that every occupied mosque in Delhi by the refugees from Pakistan be returned to the Muslim community. He made this an essential plank of his response to the communal riots that were taking place in Delhi. He was a one-man boundary force because he had the right moral values. And these moral values are now lacking at the center. As for the question, which was very, very, I think, pertinent, would a Congress government have done better than the current government in responding to the pandemic? I can only say, I hope so. I cannot say yes, because the hypothesis is based upon our being a credible candidate for the governance of this country, which we are not. We are down to under 50 seats or just over 50 seats in a house that used to have 400 and more Congress members. So I think this kind of idle speculation, as I would call it, as would a Congress government have done better? Well, would a Congress government have been in power today? The answer is definitely no. And therefore, I regard this as idle speculation, but a good point on which to flay the Congress. And I hope that the dead horse will rise by being flayed by such questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your interesting response. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Mina, over to you. Sir, you're muted again. Could you turn on the mic? Thank you. Uh, I will only talk about the question about ministries of Panchayati Raj and rural development. Have they done enough? Um, in many cases, they've done not, not just enough, but they've done extremely well. Uh, certainly, I've seen state level ministries of Panchayati Raj and rural development uh, work very constructively uh, in uh, Karnataka, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh. And um, I should say that uh, in the period uh, under the um, UPA, when the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act was uh, first created, um, the Ministry of Rural Development and Panchayati Raj in New Delhi, the central ministry, I, I think performed brilliantly, uh, partly because the, the civil servants, the bureaucrats who they put in charge of that, uh, creating and, and managing in our NREGA, were quite brilliant. Uh, very open-minded, looking for uh, weaknesses in the system, making changes, uh, very shrewd changes when the weaknesses were found to uh, con confine, contain corruption, to promote participation and transparency. Uh, that was a case of a really quite <coughs> brilliant work. And I know that from face-to-face -face, uh, encounters with them and from, and from studies on the, in, on the ground in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan for a book that uh, a colleague and I wrote about NREGA. Uh, but uh, inevitably, you know, the, the, in other times, these ministries in other states, these ministries have not necessarily performed uh, up, to, up to standard. But I think the, the record is, is quite respectable, quite refreshing, actually. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Professor Mena. Uh, we are uh, well behind uh, our time. Uh, so if uh, I could just uh, 
request you both to provide one policy solution each before we move to the vote of thanks, formal vote of thanks, one policy solution, suggestion each uh, that you think is extremely important to strengthen uh, the panchayat PRI institutions. Yes, uh, Mr. Iyer, over to you. The only policy solution that is general and could be applied by all states and the central government is adherence to the illustrative list of subjects in the 11th and 12th schedules. If governments, all these have now been adopted in the conformity legislation of state legislatures. In fact, they've even been added to in state legislation. So it is now for the states to act on their own legislation. Forget what's given in the constitution. If they act on their own legislation, then several of the issues that I have raised in the well-performing, not so well-performing and the poorly performing states would automatically get resolved. But so long as their own legislation on local self-government are neglected by the state authorities, to that extent, the response to the pandemic will be less than optimal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Professor Mino. Uh, well, I, we know from uh, studies of uh, democratic local government across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, that um, if panchayats are to succeed, uh, if local if democratic decentralization is to succeed in uh, many producing many benefits, which it can do, uh, it, it is necessary that elected local councils have substantial powers and substantial money. Uh, and we know this to be true partly because in some Indian states where they have substantial powers and money, they've done very well. But in many Indian states, uh, they do not have uh, enough powers and they do not have enough resources. And state level uh, politicians are mainly uh, responsible for this. So in their legislating and in their informal politics, give the panchayats substantial powers and resources. It will benefit you politically, it will benefit the people of your state. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very pertinent policy suggestions. With this, we come to the end of the very eminent and distinguished uh, lecture. And uh, thank you very much. I invite, Prof I invite Dr. Arjun Kumar to formally provide the vote of thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singh Mehta. And uh, I once again thank you uh, all very much for attending this very important uh, distinguished lecture by none other than uh, uh, Manishankar Ayer, sir, who has been guiding us. And also, uh, he has spent all his lives and decades, and also our chair for today, Professor James Menor, uh, for talking and touching upon in this issue of decentralization and local self-government, especially in the context of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, let me start with just revising what we have discussed. Uh, Manisha has talked uh, a lot about not just on panchayat or not just focusing on the villages, but upon the uh, Swaraj, Gram Swaraj or local self-government as we say it, of course. And from looking into the, the functions of, of what the local governments have uh, from, from you know, part nine, nine A, schedule 11 and 12 from the constitution and also uh, highlighting uh, women and child development, focus on weaker sections, public programs, PDS, and then also uh, also touching upon what he has done and what uh, the plethora of recommendations that has given more than 60, 70. One, uh, one suggestion which he has highlighted that all the central sector schemes and all the schemes has to be uh, in tandem with the local government because that is the implementing agency and many other recommendations which sir has highlighted. Uh, going ahead, sir has also uh, touched upon this fact that more than anything else, political will is, is, is what is required to transform uh, our, our local governance, especially uh, as the questions keep coming from, you know, uh, Southern, Western, and, you know, Eastern North India. 
So sir has touched upon that uh, it's also like, you know, inverse uh, Kuznet curve or first, you know, you, you have to get in and then subsequently you see uh, that as, as, as uh, effective the panchayat of decentralized government is, corruption and other things also, it's like inversely proportional. Sir, then I have also highlighted uh, what the ethos and, and uh, plural India stand for and what uh, the forefathers and the, the vision which we have taken, touching, up, touching upon uh, Gandhiji, Ambedkar, and many of our freedom fighters and those who have uh, uh, made uh, uh, our country and the constitution. Uh, sir has also uh, uh, in brief highlighted the role of women in, in our Panchayati Raj institution and also in the local self-government. And sir has suggested that, uh, uh, v v very radical suggestion, sir, that at least each constituency have at least two parliamentarians or two elected representative, one men and women. So th those are the strong recommendation. And the chair has also added that uh, when we see that women participating in society, the outcome in terms of health, in terms of education, basic facilities uh, increases. So uh, uh, those have been, has been finding uh, from the talks today. And, uh, uh, and uh, finally, our, our chair, Professor James Manor highlighted that empowering the, the panchayats or local self-government with finances is something which is also of a very critical or nerve kind of uh, importance, which will lead uh, for effective governance. Uh, uh, finally, I would, I would like to thank all, all our participants, especially our chair, Professor James Manor, and, and our speaker and for our distinguished lecture today, uh, Maniyanka Sher, sir, for uh, so graciously taking out time and spending time with us here and highlighting these all very pertinent issues. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Simil Mehta, for being here, moderating the session, and uh, all our uh, uh, viewers and all our well-wishers. Uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, keep safe, keep healthy, and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arjun. So before we just log off, I would request uh, uh, you to take down this. Uh, I, I would love to take a screenshot, uh, a group no. photograph. Yes, yes. Ritika, if you could turn on your video. I'm just taking a group photograph to commemorate, to have this memorable. So uh, I would like to introduce to you Ritika, Ms. Ritika Gupta. She is a senior research assistant at Impact and Policy Research Institute. Yes, there we go. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much. And have, have a, nice a very day. good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We can...